The Second World War had been a fight for the nation's survival against the Nazi war machine. Aerial bombardment on a scale never before known had killed huge numbers of civilians on the home front. It had also destroyed much of Britain's architectural heritage. But out of the ruins was born the modern listing system that signalled a new, hopefully safer, future for the best old buildings of Britain. But as the victory cheers faded for Winston Churchill and he was booted out in the general election of 1945, so the war-weary British turned their backs on the past. Surely it was time for a new and brighter future. Before the war, only a few fashionable followers of continental chic and, of course, the penguins at London Zoo had flirted with modernity and modernism. Now it would become the popular mood of a nation embarking on a 30-year love affair with the future. History was in for a rough time. It was even called the Rape of Britain. But heritage laws and organizations had never been stronger, and the personalities of the movement would become national figures, egging the public on to fight back as modernism became discredited. Heritage would make an astonishing comeback as it adapted to survive in the modern world. In 1945, Clement Attlee's Labour Party swept to power in a landslide victory. Armed with the slogan, let us face the future, Attlee promised the nation a new start, and the people wanted to see it happen, fast. The Labour Party's great victory shows that the country is ready for a new policy to face new world conditions. There are some people who long for the past. They would like to see their town rebuilt exactly as it used to be. But of course, where there's been so much destruction, that's out of the question. Now, would somebody switch off the lights, please, and we have some pictures. The new visionaries would reinvent our towns and cities. And as post-war Germany and Poland rebuilt lost historic streets, Britain embraced ring roads and zoning. The car would be king. The city would be a machine. A new world was rolled out, and nothing must stand in the way. Because post-war reconstruction went hands in hand with, in England with the notion of modernization that meant clearing out the old world all too often. So city centers would be rebuilt. We would have inner city ring roads. We'd build motorways. Um, everything that was old and fusty and dirty and war damaged really ought to go to usher in this clean new world, which went alongside national health spectacles and nice filled clean teeth um, and clean hair free of nits and uh, all good things but that the level of destruction was absolutely extraordinary. So often it's said of course that uh, more damage was done by developers than uh, the Luftwaffe achieved and there's a great deal of truth in that. Uh, often you find when you look into the history of places that a lot of the destruction took place after the bombing. Um, buildings that could have been restored were then swept away. There was a huge programme of demolition, a determination to rebuild town centres along modernist lines of replanning. There was a huge plan to, uh, to rearrange the whole of Whitehall. They were just going to leave Westminster Abbey and the Houses of Parliament, but the whole of the rest was going to go. And many towns and cities were replanned in a very aggressive way. Well, that's the plan the architects have drawn up for the London of the future. What a grand opportunity it is. If we miss this chance to rebuild London, we shall have missed one of the great moments of history. We shall have shown ourselves unworthy of our victory. The war, it turned out, had been a style war as well as a fight against the Nazis. 
final victory would only be assured in modernity. Old buildings were seen as part of the problem uh, for society rather than part of the solution to creating a, a sort of new identity for a, for a new Britain. And I think that the massive demolition of, uh, of housing, um, of Georgian terraces, of Victorian terraces, um, the, the huge destruction of, uh, of public buildings, of churches, country houses, all those things were seen as a way of transforming society, getting rid of the sort of detritus, the stuff that was uh, holding us back. And it was into this confusion that the first peacetime army of government listing inspectors advanced. They set off enthusiastically around the country to mount a counter-attack on behalf of history. The new system was impressively well thought out, with grades one to three categorizing the historic built environment of Britain. But, as ever, it didn't go far enough. Georgian buildings remained underrated. Humble buildings often slipped through the system, and Victorian buildings were positively dismissed. It was also the age of the filthy city. In 1950s Britain, any urban building more than 50 years old was covered in the soot and grime of industry. It consigned so much Victorian exuberance to the demolition gang. A great deal of prejudice had to be overcome. Um, it's sad, really. It's a fact about human beings um, that, that when buildings are dirty and decrepit, um, people cannot see beyond the dirt to what's underneath. Um, people have long regarded you know, Victorian buildings as hideous and worthless, but actually most of them were still standing because they were so well built. By the middle of the 20th century, everything Victorian was just hated laughed at, despised. The ignorance and the disdain that the 20th century felt for the Victorians was about like what um, the 17th century on the whole felt for the Middle Ages. These things were thought to be old, crumbly, embarrassing, overdone. And so everything that the Victorians represented, solidity, permanence, detail, elaboration, were absolutely out. <laughs> But in 1958, in the comfortable streets of Kensington in London, at her Victorian townhouse, the Countess of Ross, former society beauty and future mother-in-law of Princess Margaret, summoned like-minded friends to her home. The dirty figure of Victorian architecture was about to be embraced. There was a lot of gush about her, um, but behind the gush, she was a very tough, capable lady. Uh, I've just been coming across letters from her to me recently, and they all start uh, very dearest Mark. But I'm sure all her letters started that way. And she had this, this lovely house um, in Stafford Terrace uh, where they, she used, they used to give frightfully good parties, which were very glamorous and enjoyable. Fueled by hefty cocktails, mixed by the butler, it was agreed a new society should be formed with a single mission in mind, to ensure the best Victorian buildings and their contents do not disappear before their merits are more generally appreciated. It was fun, it was lively. We, we were pioneers, we were great say Victorian architecture. We got drunk in pubs together or we went on outings and it, it's all very enjoyable. I know there was someone called Ivor Idris who was the first treasurer, um, who was Idris Soft Drinks. We were very impressed by him because he was a businessman. Nicholas Pevsner, of course, who was a professional art historian. There was Canon Mortlock, who was an amusing person. Mrs. Christensen, who had a lovely sort of tinkling voice, like the tinkling of a bell. We were very friendly. We didn't have rows at the committee meeting in those days. And I never spoke at all, because I hate committees and I'm very bad at them. 
So John Betjeman said, um, dear little Mark, so good and never speaks a word. But beyond the cocktails and the glossy banter, the Victorian society meant business. And two of its members would come to define the post-war heritage world. And as ever, heritage seemed to attract opposites. The romantic versus the academic. Nicholas Pefferson and John Betjeman were colleagues and um, at times friends. They had a very different view of the world. It was quite inevitable. They came from such different backgrounds, one from um, Hampstead in North London and one from Germany. And they couldn't be more different. One a professional art historian, the other a willfully self-conscious amateur and dilettante. Pevsner studied history of art at the universities of Leipzig, Munich, Berlin and Frankfurt. And while he was an ardent admirer of the supremacy of German modernism, he devoted his doctoral thesis to the German Baroque. Stripped of his university lectureship by Nazi anti-Jewish laws, he emigrated to Britain in 1933. Pevner was extraordinary. As chairman of the Victorian Society, he gave the society seriousness um, and clout, uh, which he used to great effect. And um, he, he sort of transformed the society from uh, being a rather small, amateurish organisation into something that you know, governments listened to and, and took note of. And, of course, Pevner's other astonishing achievement, of course, is the buildings of England, which none of us could do without. I mean, nobody else but somebody... Pevner, I think, could have started and finished the buildings of England. Um, absolutely a central tool, because knowledge is, is power. In his trusty Austin 1100, and taking 23 years to do it, Pevsner methodically crisscrossed the country, cataloguing England's most important buildings. Well, now for Barrow. Uh, mind that dog. Now for Barrow. The result was 46 volumes of The Buildings of England followed up by series on Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And these were not guidebooks, but each volume an inventory of a county's architectural assets. Buildings were dated and appraised with academic precision. Up there, a type of capital, which is unmistakable for the architectural historian, and which one can date. Uh, about 11, oh, 70, 80, that sort of thing. Now, there are leaves on these capitals, broad, rather fleshy leaves, and they, those leaves turn at the tip inwards. They do this sort of thing. The Ionic Greek order does that sort of thing. Now, where you find these capitals, you can be sure that you are about 1175, and that must be the time when all this was built really rather quickly. Every building of importance was to be included, with Pevsner the nation's self-appointed new arbiter of architectural quality. And since Pevsner was as much at home with modernist architecture as medieval, the range of building types was greater even than for the government listing operation. The evening before each day, my mother would sit down with the map uh, and plan the next day which places would be ticked off and they would set out at about nine o'clock in the morning and they would get to the first village or church or house and uh, my father would jump out with a clipboard and paper and do the outside and then go and do the inside they would stop briefly for a picnic lunch which my mother had prepared the previous evening and they would go on till about six o'clock and at about six o'clock, they would reach where they were going to spend the night and they would have supper. And then my father would sit down and he would write from his notes of all the things that had been seen that day until about midnight. That was seven days a week for a month. The program was to do a county in, in a month. Each, each of those journeys was one month. And while Pevsner travelled by car, Betjeman went by train. At Oxford, his tutor declared Betjeman an idle prig. And indeed, he fell effortlessly into the country house weekend artist set 
in pursuit of upper-class gals. But Betjeman needed to work, describing himself as a poet and a hack. The combination would make him a natural on television. Snow falls in the buffet of Alderskit station. Soot hangs in the tunnel in clouds of steam. City of London, before the next desecration, let your steepled forest of churches be my theme. Sunday silence, with every street a dead street, alley and courtyard empty and cobbled mews, till tingle tang the bell of St Mildred's bread street summoned the sermon taster to high box pews. Snow falls in the buffet of Aldersgate station. Toiling and doomed from Moorgit Street puffs the train. For us of the steam and the gaslight, the lost generation, the new white cliffs of the city are built in vain. What inspired him? What he cared deeply about was the indeterminate beauty of England, the, the beauty that can't be labelled, the ordinary streets, the brick terraces, places that give character, that aren't famously beautiful, but are ordinary and characterful England. He saw buildings very much belonging in landscapes. They were never divorced objects. That's why Telly was so good at showing that, that you could do a pull shot away and see the surroundings and how important it was. He was a natural show-off, and he was a real pro, because a lot of people in those days were quite stiff and embarrassed. Um, so that was a very good platform for him to campaign on. I can remember when, where we are now, was the Manchester Hotel and where this bracken and rose bay grows. Once down in the passages, which are tiled, you can still see the tiles, once people hurried along with trays of tea. And now all that remains is this and the bombed ruins there of Aldersgate Street Station. From the earliest days of antiquarianism and the study of ancient monuments, there'd been a tension between different approaches to history, the romantic versus the academic. Now the antipathy seemed to surface once again, this time in the modern figures of Pevsner and Betjeman. They were not friends, but... Uh, I never heard my father say to anybody or in any, in any uh, circumstances anything other than uh, that he and John Betjeman did different things. Pevsner versus my dad war, which um, was fanned by various academics into a ridiculous bonfire of trouble, um, wasn't there at all, really. I mean, they didn't loathe each other. They, they got on fine. He was critical of the fact that there was not the rigorous discipline of history of art and history of art education in this country that he had grown up with in Germany, that the history of art uh, was a, a much more amateur in England. My father was romantic about buildings and I think that's because he had emotional reactions rather than academic reactions. I mean, he never ever set a date to me in my whole life, I don't think. It was just, isn't this beautiful? He thought what John Betjeman did I suppose, not meant derogatorily, but he, he added cosiness uh, to the idea of conservation, especially of Victorian conservation. Uh, and my father's approach to that uh, was, was different. They both, in their own way, brought the value of 
the fabric of England to the public. So what does it matter if they did it in different ways? My dad through his gut my, and Pevsner through his knowledge, his academic knowledge, it, it doesn't matter because um, they've both done a bloody good job. Betjeman and Pevsner, together with the Victorian Society, would lead the most important heritage campaign of the era. The fight to save the Euston Arch from demolition. The biggest Doric arch ever built in Britain, completed in 1837 in the Greek Revival style as the entrance to London's first big railway station. It is more correctly called a propyleum, the classical term for a freestanding arch leading to somewhere of great importance. No one, alas, seemed too sorry to say goodbye to the old station, but the arch, with its heroic and romantic scale, rallied the public to its defense. It seemed to have qualities lacking in the post-war world. The Victorians built to last. They built this gateway to Birmingham in granite. Now, 125 years later, it's to come down. But who is this pushing his way to the foot of the gallows with a last message of hope? Who but Mr. John Betjeman of the Victorian Society? Why should we bother with this arch? It was the first arch, first bit of railway architecture in the world of any size. It's very grand scale, fine stone, granite, and if it were moved forward in front of the new Euston station, it would be the most magnificent public monument in London. Moving the arch forward would have been a simple operation, but in a Britain craving modernity and functionality, a symbol to a bygone age had no meaning. Even the aging prime minister seemed to have forgotten his history. Conservationists like John Betjeman, took the issue right up to the top levels. The Prime Minister at the time, Harold Macmillan. Harold Macmillan, who just dismissed it, was a classical scholar. When he had been wounded as a young officer in the First World War, he lay in a shell hole on the Western Front, waiting to be rescued by the stretcher bearers. And he sat, do you know what he did there? He sat reading Aeschylus in Greek. Uh, and then he happily dismissed the Euston Arch, one of the greatest pieces of Greek revival architecture in England. The great villain, of course, is Harold Macmillan. Dreadful man who couldn't care a damn, cynical old wig that he was. But the arch could have been dismantled or moved, as people showed at the time, and it didn't, wouldn't have cost that much. One editorial in the Victorian Society um, annual, I think, said that uh, the cost of moving the arch was... Um, less than that of um, buying um, two rather indifferent Renoirs, which had just been acquired by the nation, which nobody was threatening to destroy. Demolition work began in December 1961. It was brutal. But at least the arch was spared explosives because of the danger to adjacent buildings. The Victorian Society mournfully reported with regret, we must accept the reduction of the Euston portico to rubble as a total defeat, but not without the satisfaction of having fought inch by inch to the last ditch for its preservation. The lorries bore away the bones of the arch, according to rumor, to become hardcore for an airport runway. It was our first battle. It was a great defeat, but at the same time, it was a noisy defeat. This campaign brought many, many people together to preserve the arch. And the important thing about the campaign is that it lost. And so there was a kind of feeling of never again. So the heritage movement made new alliances gained new friends, and adapted to fight in the modern world. Plans by British Rail to demolish the Victorian masterpiece of St Pancras Station were successfully resisted. But there were more defeats too. London's Great Coal Exchange was demolished. 
The beaching report took an axe to the rail network, closing Victorian rural stations up and down the country. And in 1964, the demolition gang came for Jardine Hall in Dumfriesshire, the family home of Captain Ronnie Cunningham Jardine. Yes, it was a very happy place to do, and one was spoiled most damnably, looking back on it. Everything was big, it had to be big. The staircase was how you could have marched an army up and down it, you know, all abreast. And me being a little fella and used to swank to uh, my friends that our house was really big compared with theirs, <laughs> which was probably just as big. <laughs> Built in 1818 by Scottish architect Gillespie Graham, who had worked on the classical glories of Edinburgh Newtown, the house was handed over to Captain Ronnie by his mother in 1962. It was handed to me. And then I suddenly realised, help, what am I going to do with it? I didn't think it was old enough to be a visitor attraction. It was just uh, a mausoleum. <laughs> so I eventually said to my mother, I really think I want to get rid of this place. And she said, well, I can understand, Ronnie, but you sure you're doing the right thing? And uh, I'm afraid I said, yes, I think I am. I'm very upset she was. And so then I got on to a firm of demolishers of Glasgow. And they said, oh, we'll just have four sticks of jelly night in each corner of the house, and away she'll go. Come on, boys. Come on, boys. Come. Come. Come on, yeah. Now, Come. Captain Ronnie lives in the estate dower house. But the big house still casts a shadow. 1964, I blew it up. 1964. I can't remember the month. Uh, but this is about the place where my mother and I stood to watch the blowing up. Of course, in those days there weren't this line of trees here, so you saw the whole, the whole uh, house standing completely bare and a very good view. And hopefully no rocks and most things were going to come this far from the house. So here we stood and we waited and I remember holding my mother's hand and... Uh, this is where she went up, but it did take, as I told you, four times before she actually went went up. A big boom, big, solid boom. My mother, she was upset, she was indeed, but uh, she'd had a good life here the whole time, and that was her home, destroyed. There we go. Very moving. Uh, and then we went away and went had a cup of tea, I think. <laughs> That's what I think it was. Anyhow, it was uh, a bad moment. But uh, it had to be done, in my opinion. The demise of Jardine Hall was echoed all over Britain. By the mid-60s, hundreds of great country houses were in trouble. The trickle of owners bringing their sorry stories to the National Trust had turned into a torrent. But it was clear no single organisation, no single tax arrangement could hope to deal with the problem. It would usher in a new age of entrepreneurial experiment. For good or ill, the Lions of Longleat reinvented the country house. And if a Marcus was there to take your money at the gate, so much the better. No, Cineland, I'll pay you your money back. I guarantee you, let me know. I'm the boss here. People will drive through with their windows open and they put their elbows out. And they must not do that. If they do it, it's their own fault. It's a wonderful feeling that it's alive once again. Uh, maybe it's not the same type of people for which it was built. That doesn't matter to me. I mean, after all, these big houses originally were built by their by, by ancestors to entertain their guests. Well, now these people aren't my guests, but they are, in a sense, guests, except they've got to pay three and six to, to be my guest.
other houses, such as Woburn, Bewley and Chatsworth, proved money could be made. But Heritage needed a new look to attract big numbers. At Woburn in 1967, the Festival of Flower Children was the ultimate new look. The National Trust was being left behind. There was an enormous row in the National Trust, um, a conflict between what you might loosely call the progressives, who had an image of the Trust becoming a very popular organisation with mass support, and the more reactionary element, which said, we're not in the business of bringing in billions of people and having a mass membership. And uh, that led to a great deal of acrimony and, and, and difficulty and an annual general meeting when feelings ran very high. And after that, a committee of taste was set up. And the result of that was that they considered lots of things which the National Trust might sell, and the committee came to the conclusion that every one of them was um, not worthy of the organisation. Um, and uh, that might have been the end of the story. But actually, uh, the chairman and others were determined that progress should be made. The Trust's timing was spot on. In 1968, 20 million people a week for 26 episodes tuned in to see the grumpy, money-grubbing, feuding Victorians in the BBC's adaptation of the Forsyth Saga. Heightened emotions set against period architecture made gripping TV. And suddenly, every National Trust property seemed to have more of a story to tell. Hello, Forsyth. Well, I found the very place for your house. Look here. You may be clever, but this site will cost me half as much again. Well, hang the cost, man. Look at the view. The climate was in favour of a change at the Trust. Perhaps, after all, you could have a tasteful bestseller. It was the birth of Tea Towel Heritage. Dear Miss Albeck, I venture to write to you, as your name has been given to me by Mary Trevelyan. The Trust wants to commission one or two designs for tea towels incorporating subjects associated with the Trust. Buildings, birds, flowers, etc. I understand that you have designed some attractive things of this sort. This is the very first National Trust tea towel that I did, which was for a house in Devon called Saltram. And it's a, a design using copper pans, a sort of pattern of the things that you find in the kitchen. But these are specifically from that kitchen. Copper is a nice thing to draw. Particularly, I like the shape of jelly moulds. The other one is based on the Adam carpet, which I really did not want to do because I thought it was really sacrilege to dry up on, on a great designer's carpet. But I did what I was told because um, I had to, really. From the Trust's founding symbol of the oak leaf to the comfy aristocrats of country house living, even a well-stocked stately home larder. It was the perfect middle-class souvenir. By the late 1960s, the arrogant front of British modernism was beginning to look flimsy, increasingly low-grade, even cynical. The ambition of the movement, always unrealistic, had been undermined by a bankrupt post-war economy and local government corruption. Indeed, from the start, corners had been cut. The modern world being built physically around the National Health Service, education and beyond was largely in new forms of architecture that were, at the time, fairly cheap, cold, dull, and pretty uninteresting that many people have come to despise in England. It wasn't our finest moment in architecture. Um, the modern movement in Britain, modernism in Britain, was adopted awkwardly, late, and rather badly and cheaply for the most part. The end of modernism, or at least the beginning of the end, had come in a spectacularly tragic fashion. The collapse after a gas explosion of a substandard skyscraper called Ronan Point in East London killed four people and injured 17. 
But in spite of the demise of modernism, the attack on old buildings continued for several years. By the early 70s, it had reached unbelievable intensity. There were plans to demolish Piccadilly Circus, um, uh, Carlson House Terrace, uh, the Foreign Office, the whole area around Parliament Square. I mean, the most appalling things were going to be done. Um, uh, Covent Garden was going to be like Paternoster Square in the city. It was going to be flattened. Uh, the, the Strand would become London Wall. I mean, it, it, it was horrific. And I think a general feeling that, come on now, everybody, stop. What are we doing? Um, it took over. We have got to show ours physically by demonstration, even with marches and standing outside of town halls. This is what we've got to do. We've got to let them know we're here. By 1975, according to the new pressure group Save Britain's Heritage, the country was losing a listed building every day to demolition. Never a guarantee of protection, the listing system was now being undermined by the get-rich-quick rewards of property development and councils after cheap and easy solutions. The fight back united people all over the country. Civilization was at risk. We can stop them. It isn't too late. Campaign alliances crossed traditional class divides and party politics to create a new force to be reckoned with. It'll take all history away attached from the decision. Yeah. It'll do away with the complete. You know, this is renowned, and this should not change, certainly. Oh, oh no, no. you oh. ruin us. You ruin You're it. You ruin it. It's beautiful as it is. Heritage undoubtedly enters the sort of mainstream of people's consciousness, uh, of, of people's concerns in the 1970s, and it's a direct response to the destruction of historic places, historic places that were beautiful, and more importantly, historic places that people felt they owned. The places where they lived, the places where they worked, were being crunched up and taken away and replaced with concrete, and that was not something that people liked. <laughs> Nostalgia crew, like Topsy. It was a fascinating moment. If you look, whether it was in fashion, in music, in design, in architecture, you get this retro look, this heritage look starts to starts to become dominant, whether it's Laura Ashley dresses or you know, neoclassical architects starting to get work again. And now let's hang on to what we know, and what we know, and what we've always been good at this country is craft and countryside and Cotswold cottages. Back they came. They could have shouted in the streets, modernism is dead, long live heritage. And if the moment needed a headline, they got one, when 1975 was declared European Architectural Heritage Year. Materially, it changed nothing. Emotionally, it changed rather a lot. Uh, it was a very imprecise term, and still is a very imprecise term, and can cover everything from our natural heritage to our built heritage to music, painting, all sorts, all sorts of things. Oh, heritage is a horrible word. I think we all hate it. I much prefer history, but that implies a sort of written, bookish kind of history. So I, I always try not to use the word heritage, and yet heritage is the word that means so much that um, it, it's useful. Um, and I think in the end, the heritage is whatever we really care about. Heritage is so much more uh, ideologically unstable an idea than the idea of conservation or even restoration. It's something which is, is more emotional and, in, in my view, more ideological. Because the question is, whose heritage is it? But the word heritage seemed to open things up. The upper-class version of history, a mainstay of tourism and visitor attractions since the war, would be challenged. The heritage industry was expanding. Although, as working-class heritage stood to gain a voice, so British working-class industrial life, for real, died. And it wasn't the only irony. 
It is the supreme paradox that most of the mainstream conservation bodies in Britain uh, came into being as a reaction against the horrors of industrialization, the effect of industrialization on the landscape. All of that makes one realize how radical an idea it was to propose the preservation of industrial sites because there was no sentiment amongst official uh, conservation bodies that was sympathetic to that idea. Well, there's a lot more to architecture and the nation's history and our architectural heritage than country houses. And always there has been this like regrettable snobbery about people who are particularly upset with the country houses. But there are many of us who are concerned about architecture. And we live in cities and we care about urban buildings where the, the different values perhaps operate. The working classes of Britain, their history was best told through a study of industrial sites. Industrial revolution had begun in this country. Enormous historic interest in the processes, in the products, in the way of life of most of the people of this country. And yet heritage had, it was felt, been fixated on ancient castles, earthworks, smart aristocratic houses. What about every man's history? The interesting aspect of it is that the official heritage bodies uh, the Department of the Environment as it was to become and the National Trust didn't know how to cope at all. It was entirely off their radar in terms of their ability to appreciate its importance and certainly their capacity to handle it in a, a physical sense. Industrial sites were a nightmare. They were huge, they were very expensive, they were often built out of materials that were uh, designed to uh, uh, to last as long as that industrial process was being done and no longer. So they were rapidly decaying. And the, uh, the scale of the problem that was faced in terms of industry was so much greater, exponentially larger than country houses, than castles, than anything that had to be faced before. A single coal mine, uh, the, the, the amount of money that was needed to save it was so much greater than any amount of money that had been put forward in terms of um, uh, saving heritage up until that point. The Office of Works, or as it had now become the Department of the Environment, bought its first industrial site in 1974. It was a bobbin mill in Cumbria. Stott Park had been producing bobbins for the cotton industry for 150 years, until its closure in 1971. This was a real rescue mission to save the last factory doing an activity which the sort of industrial might of the nation was built on the back of. And to keep it operational, which also was very, very important, because most monuments that had been taken on and opened to the public were, if you like, dead. They were things, they were places where things had happened and where you had to stand and say, well, this is where such and such used to happen. This is the automatic driving machine which you're going to do probably 9,000 a day on here. And you just feed them on when you board the hole through, take them off, put another two on. And you take them off, put another two on. Now, next stage is we're going to finish these, so we'll go around and we'll put these up finishing there. To go to a place where the activity was actually going on was a completely revolutionary experience, both for the visitor but also for the Department of the Environment when they actually took the place on. But as industrial visitor sites, railway stations, factories, disused mines grew in popularity, the country house, so infinitely reinventable, fought back. Suddenly, life below stairs was more interesting than all the fine fripperies of the drawing room. One National Trust property in particular led the way. Erswick in North Wales broke the mould. Actually, the Trust, quite, in a quite pioneering way, this is in the 70s, decided to present Erswick as entirely from the servant's perspective. And that was, that was really uh, exciting and, and, and visionary and new. And actually, what we discovered was really, really obvious. People love hearing about the servants because they don't necessarily connect with the great families. People connect and they think that the great-great-grandmother might well have been a kitchen maid. They certainly don't think she would have been the dowager duchess. <laughs> 
1979, Margaret Thatcher arrived in Downing Street with the biggest new broom since Clement Attlee. Privatization and increased profit was the order of the day, and heritage was not excused. In spite of her embrace of Victorian values, she would seek to reverse the work of John Lubbock, whose Ancient Monuments Act of 1882 had first committed the state to acquiring the nation's heritage. Her first Secretary of State for the Environment, Michael Heseltine, had clear instructions. Privatize the ruined abbeys and castles of Britain. The National Trust was a very important part of the thinking because here was a private sector organisation running very important parts of Britain's heritage very successfully, uh, depending on public subscription or access fees or whatever. Um, and my first option was to go to, I think it was Lord Gibson at the time, who was chairman, and say, look, why don't you take over the, the state-owned sector, make it into one major operation? And I'll never forget his, uh, his, um, uh, his reply. He said, not with your trade unions, because he would have inherited what, quite frankly, was a quite unacceptable union approach to what we were trying to achieve. Uh, so he, he turned it down as an idea flat. In the end, the Thatcher government opted for a series of quangos. English heritage was created in 1983, Cadw in Wales in 84, and historic Scotland followed on. Lord Montague of Bewley, who had commercialised his own home so successfully in the 1960s, was the first chairman of English heritage. The mere appointment of someone like Lord Montague, as opposed to bureaucrats of whom people would not have heard, was an indication of the new priorities we wanted to establish and the new image we wanted to create. It was about finding ways of commercialising and uh, running more cheaply the vast number of historic buildings that the government had collected since the 1880s. So a major brief that was given to Lord Montague was make them exciting. Make those castles live and dance and sing for their money. And that's what he set out to do, essentially. And ever since the 1980s, the cut and thrust of the heritage market has meant fancy dress is on the up. And what's harmless fun for some is the unforgivable compromise of authenticity and atmosphere for others. There is, of course, great tension in the, as it were, the heritage world over how you but not only preserve but um, present buildings. And I suppose sometimes it's a form of snobbery that one rather objects to um, the vulgarisation of houses with people dressing up. I mean, I don't care for it myself. It's partly a matter of taste, but it does mean sometimes that you can't actually enjoy the building that's there that you've gone to see. So the whole world of you know, people dressing up, I personally um, don't care for. Obviously, some people do like it. We have got to maintain our income. Uh, we now have to do that in a very competitive climate. Some people say, well, you shouldn't go down that route. You're, you're selling out, you're Disneyfying. Um, I just don't think we are. I mean, we've got plenty of things to learn from Disney. I've got a great respect for the Disney organisation. The competition for visitor attractions at weekends is intense. We've got to keep up with the game. In fact, today's approach to heritage is more mixed than many reports would have you believe. The tranquil, the studiously authentic, even the untouched look still has a place and may even be making a comeback. At Cork Abbey in Derbyshire, not only is there no singing and dancing, but the house is frozen at the critical point of its demise, a through-the-keyhole glimpse of the life-or-death moment of a stately home. Here, long-suffering cleaners must know the difference between heritage dirt to be saved and modern dust to be vacuumed away. Commercial, it isn't. Court came to us in 1985, so anything that fell before 1985 is historic and it can stay. Anything after that, which is probably created by our visitors and our building works, has to go. So 
we've got a nice sort of line of what becomes historic dirt and what becomes um, dust. I think our dirt and dust is cork and it is our heritage and it's something that we try and keep and pass on for future generations. At Stonehenge as well, tranquility is set for a comeback. The prehistoric site has been a barometer of the heritage industry since the days of Britain's first inspector of ancient monuments. Now it is set to recapture some of its romance and mystery. English heritage plans will see the nearby section of the busy A344 wiped off the map later this year. It's certainly been, in recent times, described as a national disgrace. I'm, I'm feeling how much better it's going to be when we can get rid of those fences and the road is gone and it's all back to grassland and to really get a sense of what it would have been like in, in ancient times to arrive at this fantastic monument. So how does the future for heritage look in Britain today? Inevitably, there are challenges ahead. I, mean, I think the National Trust has always been um, a, 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 almost a paradox, but certainly about, about many different things. Uh, we're about you know, muddy boots in the countryside. Um, we're about saving the uplands and the coast. Um, we're about nature conservation, um, moths, birds, bees, and so on. Um, and we're about um, Chippendale furniture, um, you know, Adam interiors, and um, fine paintings. Um, it's not always easy to keep these things you know, in tandem, but they are in tandem. Um, uh, they all depend on one thing, us having the money to do it. For English heritage, the biggest challenge is the listing of modern buildings. But now that the process has caught up with contemporary architecture, the bad old days of unappreciated styles falling through the net, supposedly, are over even though the process can be hugely under pressure in times of recession. Ever since the shock demolition of the Art Deco Firestone factory on the outskirts of London by a devious developer in 1980, English heritage has been empowered to list architecture from between the wars. Now, post-war architecture is covered as well, and even a 10-year-old building at risk can be listed. The youngest listed building is currently Lloyd's in the City of London, designed by Richard Rogers and completed in 1986. And it can only be a matter of time before the gherkin follows. Other choices are more controversial. Listing recent buildings is the single most difficult thing that English Heritage has to do, because in the listing process, you're both following taste and you're leading it. There are some people who already appreciate buildings that were put up in the 70s and the 80s. There are equally quite a lot of people around who lived through the period when they were put up and think they're diabolical, ugly blots in the landscape. And so what the job of the listing uh, inspector to do is, is to steer the way um, between those two lots of opinion to work out what is really important for future generations. And those judgments are extremely difficult and can be extremely controversial. Imaginative reuse will be the mantra of the heritage movement in the future. Two great examples show the way. The resurrection of St Pancras Station in London as the nation's rail link with the continent and the reinvention of Bankside Power Station as Tate Modern, London's home of contemporary art. And maybe, just maybe, a third is about to surface. The Euston Arch, whose demolition triggered the modern heritage movement 50 years ago, is set to rise again. Architectural historian Dan Cruikshank located the remains of the arch at the bottom of the River Lee in East London back in 1993. The stones had been acquired by British waterways from the demolition contractor to plug a hole in the bed of the river. Now, many more stones have been raised from the riverbed, and with plans to redevelop Euston Station after the government's recent go-ahead of the new high-speed rail link between London and the north, 
The chances of a resurrected arch have never looked better. Dan is meeting with structural engineer Alan Baxter. This is one of the capitals of one of the Doric piers uh, framing the columns uh, this is on one of the corners. So we can see exactly where this stone was on the, on, the, on, the, on the major drawings of the building we've got executed at the time, you know, in the 1950s by British Railway just before they demolished it. So this is it's a beautiful piece. It gives you a sense of the scale, the precision, the Grecian architecture. That's, of course, from demolition. We can fill that in. But look how accurate that still yes, is. Yes, yes. We worked out that of the stones of the arch, the arch had about um, well, 4,400 tonnes of Bramley Fall grit stone used to construct it in the late 1830s. There's certainly well over 60% down there, well over. And it's in incredibly good condition. Indeed, indeed. I mean, this is fantastic. It's, it's had a good, you know, it's withstood 130 years of soot at Euston and has enjoyed, you know, 50 or so years of, of, of a, a nice, you know, nice bath. It's, it's, in, it's incredibly good, Nick. They've been really wantonly demolished when it was uh, destroyed. They could have been taken down stone by stone and other arches, like Marble Arch, has moved. It was, it was really vandalism. And you can see the damage that's been done, but it's easy to repair it when we put the arch up again. For Dan, who believes the Euston Propyleum is one of the greatest structures ever made, there is one all-important question. Coming on to money, Huge areas of, of, of speculation, you know, not sure how many stones we can get back, not sure how much repair is necessary and so on and so forth. In current terms, you know, 2012, what do you reckon is the, the figure, you know? I, mean, just, I know it's like plucking it from the air, but and your huge expertise and experience, what do you reckon? Well, I, I think we costed it at 12 million 12. pounds. And then the commercial value of the room at the top and the basement might be a couple of million. So we just need a ten million pounds, please. And there is a collecting pot for the Eastern <laughs> Arch Trust for this. This is a very hopeful moment for the Arch, but for a lot of other things too. It's not that I'm an excessive optimist, but it's a much, much better climate now for the care of cities, for the care of what we have from the past, but also of creating really wonderful new things too. So it's a time for a really interesting fusion of new and old. For more information about English Heritage's complimentary exhibition to the series, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash battle for Britain's past.